former president Viktor Yanukovych's party, bribery there. And we're going to give you an update on uh, Moldova's Transnistria conflict. In the meantime, you can download our podcast on Mixcloud. Uh, and if you, uh, you can go online to do that. Also, if you want to watch our broadcast in Ukrainian, uh, it's being translated right now simultaneously. You can find that on our website. And uh, you can also make sure to stay with, in touch with us throughout the week by watching all of our content on YouTube, the unedited full-length interviews, and all of that. And thank you. We'll be with you in one second. This weekend saw a Mejiria Fest, where investigative reporters from around the world congregated at ousted President Viktor Yanukovych's state, uh, just to the north of Kiev on the Kiev Sea. Among those in attendance were Hermatsky investigative reporters, uh, two of whom won a pr uh, prize, I should note, that was Angelina Karyakina and Nastya Stanka. Uh, but uh, a bunch of them were also investigative reporters from our Slitsvo.info division, the investigative division who worked with the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project on the Panama Papers. Uh, those papers revealed that President Petro Poroshenko had an offshore, uh, an offshore business, which he was al allegedly using to shield his Russian corporation from taxes, as well as documents showing that he may have moved uh, 4 million euro offshore. Poroshenko addressed the allegations directly at a press conference uh, this past Friday, which you can watch right here. Дивіться, <laughs> А була вибрана саме юрисдикція, де мінімальна ставка податку на продаж активів. Адже коли ця компанія була створена, коли вона створена була, тоді ще не йшлося про сліпий траст, а йшлося саме про продаж вашого бізнесу. Дякую. Дякую. Дякую, Дмитро. Спасибі. Позиція перша. Ніякого шорного скандалу не було. Були об'єктивне, професійне. Журналістське розслідування Дмитра, не тільки Дмитра, а цілої команди журналістів, які знайшли декілька фактів. Наголошую на тому, що інформація про те, що були відкриті рахунки і перераховані гроші, чому було посвячено значна частина професійної програми, не відповідала дійсності. Кожна копійка буде оподатковується і буде оподаткована. Всі податки будуть заплачені Україні. So that was President Petro Poroshenko addressing the offshore scandal in public at a press conference on Friday. Right now, we have Drew Sullivan joining us, editor and I believe co-founder of the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting uh, Project, who was here this past weekend for Mishiria Fest. So first of all, thank you for joining us. It's my pleasure to be here, Josh. So my first question is, I mean, what's your reaction to Poroshenko's response to the uh, so-called non-existent offshore scandal? Well, he can, he can call it anything he wants, so not a scandal, but I mean, uh, the, the, the bottom line is that a, pres a sitting president is not addressing serious questions about an issue he has um, said he's very interested in, which is offshores, and um, he has not provided information um, to prove that, that he hasn't done anything illegal, and uh, Slitsvo and, and OCCRP, I think, has done a good job uh, raising issues uh, with documents that, that appear to show an opposite, uh, an opposite thing. So, I mean, you know, uh, they can say anything they want, but they should release the documents to the people so that they know exactly what went on. There's no reason not to. But so with saying anything they want, I mean, there's sort of, after the second investigation, the one that specifically alleged some sort of wrong, possible criminal wrongdoing, mm -hmm. um, there was a surprising lack of reaction, I thought, in the Ukrainian uh -huh. press. What was your impression of that? Why do you think that 
it didn't make as much of an impact as one might have expected. Well, and I think people, you know, when you start making serious allegations, people kind of stop and say, wait, you know, let's, let's see if we can figure out what's going on here. And it's a complicated issue. You know, and it has to do with, you know, how people interpret Cyprus documents. It has to do uh, with uh, tax law in, in Ukraine. So I think it's a complicated issue. And you have two sides that, that, are, that are talking. We're trying to, to talk with, with facts. And it's, you know, on the other side, it's being brushed off a little bit, saying this is not important. And I think it's difficult for readers and viewers to really understand what's happening. Sure. And, you know, there's been some pushback within Ukraine, particularly after the first uh, release. Mm -hmm. There's also been some international pushback we saw this past week in the form of a Politico op-ed written by Adrian Karatnitsky, which I think we have a, a screen of that we can show, uh, which was written. He wrote that many, if not most, of the financial structures whose inner workings have been leaked, including Poroshenko's, represent legitimate, there it is, uh, legitimate and well-established business practices. So calling these business practices legitimate and well-established. Um, I want to hear your response to that. I mean, okay. the, the implication is essentially that you all are making uh, a problem where there isn't a problem to be had. So uh, first of all, I mean, could you respond to that suggestion? And second of all, I mean, I'd be interested if you could give us some wider context on, you know, maybe perhaps why Karatnitsky felt the need to make these allegations. We've seen other things from him in the past. Right. So, yeah. Well, you know, uh, uh, Mr. Karatnitsky is was a uh, strong supporter of you know, uh, uh, Mr. Lukashenko, he was a strong supporter of Mr. Yanukovych. Now he's a strong supporter of Mr. Poroshenko. I think what you're looking at is somebody who is in the business of doing business with government, and it's in his interest to, um, uh, to uh, uh, curry favor with the government. I mean, the, the piece was an absolute puff piece um, that was insulting to uh, Slitsvo and uh, uh, Kiev Post reporters it was insulting to the, the press in, in Ukraine. It was factually wrong in many different places. Um, you know, it was just a poor piece of journalism from not a journalist, but a registered lobbyist who has represented other um, uh, dignitaries such as Milorad Dodik, the corrupt uh, uh, president of, the, of uh, the Republic of Srpska in Bosnia and other places. So he has no credibility, I think, on this issue. And he shouldn't be talking. It's embarrassing to Politico to have published that article. Sure. And you all also released a fairly strongly worded response, uh, I think, ending with, if the authors of the article really wanted to challenge the findings or reporters published in their stories, they should begin by reading them. So I'd be interested if you could, if anything comes to mind, some specific factual inaccuracies uh, existed in that piece. Well, I mean, for, first of all, they 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 uh, said that the reporters who were working on this were not investigative reporters with experience, and they dismissed them as being, you know, uh, from a developing world country. And um, you know, uh, Dimitro and Anna Babinets and and Vlad Lavrov are all award-winning journalists, and and you know, I think that. Um, you know, that, that's, that's just dismissive. Secondly, um, they said that we didn't talk to them, which is not true. Um, they dismissed this as a translation error, which is absolutely not true. We have talked to uh, a number of uh, Cyprus lawyers who have said the same thing over and over again, that, that this is, in fact, a regular, typical document that says quite clearly cash and in-kind um, valued assets were mm -hmm. sent to Cyprus, which raises the question, is there a bank account and is the president shipping $4 million offshore? I mean, that, that's the really serious question. And anything you can do to, to you know, uh, blow smoke over this is not going to make that question go away. They have to answer that question and show in their documents that they have, which will prove that, but they're not making them available. And can you speculate on why they're not making those documents available? Well, I, I, I don't want to speculate. I mean, I think they know why they're not making these documents available, and I think the public is starting to get an idea. And, you know, there, there are other work that they've done. They've brought in Baker McKenzie and, and other groups to, to vouch for the way that they've done things. And uh, even Baker McKenzie has not reviewed those documents. And so, consequently, this can be answered if uh, the, uh, this could be all put in the past if Mr. Poroshenko simply makes those documents available, and um, he should do that. So what other Panama Papers investigations regarding Ukraine can we expect? Do you have anything else in the works coming that we can expect to be released over the next few months? Um, there, there, the thing about the Panama Papers is, you know, a lot of that information is really difficult to use. Mm. It's, it's, you know, it's uh, offshore uh, correspondence between lawyers about offshore companies that we don't really know what they're doing yet. So there's a whole lot of uh, 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 stories that we still have to do. And in fact, we've got one coming out uh, uh, 
this week on uh, Mr. Roldugan again, and so um, in, in Russia, and so um, the, you will see stories coming out uh, literally over the next year um, on this, and, and we will find in, in, in five years from now, reporters will still be referring to the Panama Papers about offshores that they suddenly discover and are involved in some deal, and now it all makes sense because we know what the deal is. In many of these cases, we simply don't know what the deal is. Just as a sheer archive of information. It's an incredibly valuable archive. And I mean, have you all also gotten independent tips, the people who may know something that have come to you since the Panama Papers were released? Well, absolutely. I mean, we, we get tips fairly regularly, but I mean, I think that there is a, people are angry. People are angry. You know, I, I just toured uh, Mr. Yanukovych's house today, and right. it, you know, in, in uh, Medjug area, and it's, it's outrageous that, um, you know, my, my salary is in a couple wood panels there. You know, um, I think people are angry at how um, uh, politicians have used offshores. And, you know, a place like Ukraine, where a sizable amount of its, its economy is, is an offshore economy. Mm -hmm. um, and that really, uh, that angers people. And so anytime they see leaks and information that comes out, I think they're going to be interested. And I think you're going to find a lot more people in banks and in registration agents and in other places that deal with these people and see these kind of corruptions going on are going to start making these informations more available. Great. Thank you, Drew. We're going to want to reach out to Political Europe to uh, hear maybe next week about why they uh, decided to run that piece. It would be an interesting Good. thing. But uh, for now, Hermatsky spoke with Nova Gazeta investigative reporter Roman Anyan, who was also at the Manchuria Fest this past weekend, uh, about Good how friend. Russian leaders have managed to uh, perhaps dilute the atmosphere in a way that uh, the, the revelations surrounding Will Dugan haven't been as, uh, I don't know, pointed or sharp as one might have expected. But you can watch the video right now. Roman, uh, how did the Russian government uh, counter to the impact uh, of the Panama Papers revelation? There was no much reaction because, uh, in general, they don't care, and uh, in general, you know, stories done by journalists do not have much impact on the Russian politics or whatever. Uh, so they just said that uh, everything was a kind of masterminded campaign or plot against Russia organized by Americans and uh, despite the fact that the information is true it was packed in a special information in, in a special product to undermine the Russian uh, government of course which is not true and what about like the people of Russia like what do they think about this do they have any reaction and uh, what they gonna make about this well still the public was interested in our story because it was read by more than one million people which is a good figure but simultaneously I mean, citizens are not uh, ready to demand for changes or to demand for uh, for some, I don't know, uh, reaction from the from the state. Uh, and mainly, I think because the c citizens are afraid to express their point of view. And like, what is the difficulties of being journalist in Russia? There are a lot of them, but uh, the main one is that uh, journalists in Russia uh, face a lot of uh, face uh, strong pressure from the state. And uh, the recent example uh, with uh, RBC, probably the best uh, newsroom in the country, when uh, three editors were uh, sacked just uh, for their uh, fantastic reports, uh, proves that point of view. And uh, what do you think, like, uh, what kind of role uh, West has uh, in case of corruption in Russia? Uh, Western institutions like banks, like lawyers, like law firms, trusts, and uh, whatever, uh, they are these people actually uh, create these schemes and uh, these people are not the mean but they are also culprits of uh, the wrongdoings which happen in Russia, in Ukraine and in other parts of Eastern Europe. So that was Roman Nanin, an investigative reporter at Novaya Gazeta. Um, speaking at Mejihiria Fest. Hermatsky International had, rep had reporters at Mejihiria Fest interviewing a number of the luminaries who were there, including, um, I think, Dave Kaplan, who is a ICIJ fellow, Will Fitzgibbon, another person who works at ICIJ, a whole number of people, all of whose interviews will be available on our website, which you can see uh, over here if you take a look. Um, I'll be there in a short period.
period of time. So if any of you want to uh, you know, keep in touch with us over the week and see other insights into investigative reporting and corruption in Eastern Europe, I highly encourage you to, uh, do, to, to look at that. Um, we also have a Twitter presence that we can uh, show you. You should follow us all on Twitter at Hermotsky International, um, which we can show you in a second. Sorry, I think we're having some technical difficulties with that. Um, but we can uh, follow up with it in a brief moment. But in any case, we'll be uh, in touch with you throughout the week. And uh, we'll be on in one second after a short break. Thank you. Moldova, Ukraine's southwestern neighbor, was in talks with its breakaway region of Transnistria hosted in these talks hosted by the OSCE this week after a uh, two-year hiatus in talks. Um, the talks came two years after. It also came after a winter of protests in Moldova, largely against political parties funded by or controlled by the uh, country's really sort of singular oligarch, Vlad Palatniuk. Uh, sort of nasty guy we have. Um, but now we have Hanna Shellest joining us via Odessa from Skype. Hanna is a uh, editor-in-chief at Ukraina Analytica, a monitoring organization, and we are happy to have her on. Hi, Hanna. Um, so first of all, Hanna, I'm interested. Could you, um, part of these, all of these talks with the OAC, they were sort of about Transnistria. Could you explain uh, the region's status what, right now? Like, why does it look the way it does? And what are the talks leading towards? What kind of resolution could we possibly see from these uh, developments? Yeah, definitely. This week, uh, the quite a historical negotiations took place in Berlin because for the last two years, we haven't had any negotiation, direct negotiations in the 5 plus 2 format. It is the main negotiation format for the Transnistrian conflict resolution. Uh, it's quite an interesting because it was only protocol signed. However, all sides expressed their opinion that it is very positive negotiations and that in July, when the next uh, round will take place, it will be informal negotiations on the confidence building. They will be able maybe even to sign uh, the documents on the main issues. Currently, uh, there were uh, four main issues uh, to discuss. First, it is the uh, uh, disapproval or dissatisfaction of the Transnistrian side that several criminal cases have been um, initiated by Moldovan government a few years ago uh, against the governmental authorities of Transnistria. So it was quite a, a serious point uh, why the negotiations have not taken place within these two years. The next, uh, very technical on the first uh, side, but very important for two sides, it is so-called telecommunication issue. It is a question of the frequencies for the mobile operators of two countries, because sometimes they were just uh, stopping each other. And finally, they are very close to the decision. The uh, third issue, it is the approval of the diplomas of Transnistria. So to sides are talking in the working group about the possibility of Transnistrian diplomas to be recognized not only in Moldova, but to be in the same standards as the Moldovan um, educational type, high educational diploma. And the last but not the least, it is the question of the uh, um, car plates. So the uh, possibility and recognition of the Transnistrian car plates in the territory of Moldova. So on the first side, it is quite technical issues, but all four were very politicized by both sides. And if you multiply it on the uh, current political and economic crisis both in Moldova and Transnistria, you can imagine that for the last two years it has been very difficult to renew the negotiations. Thanks for that uh, detailed explanation, Hannah. I mean, how long away are we from a potential resolution? And I mean, what would that really look like? Would it, I mean, is, is it possible that Transnistrian independence could be widely recognized or are we looking at some sort of reintegration into Moldova? You know, there is something of the wishful thinking or even the uh, um, crystal ball uh, guessing because with the protracted conflicts, you never can say that it is tomorrow. Uh, when you don't have fighting, both sides are not ready for the uh, very quick compromise because they have nothing to lose. Sure. And uh, these two sides are living in these conditions for the last 25 years. So the year plus the year minus, uh, it's nothing for them. Uh, definitely, uh, um, if you speak now, then... Independence is probably the least possible scenario because uh, Transnistria for several times within this 25 years has been announcing it, proclaiming it. However, even Russian Federation didn't recognize it. The last time it was two years ago after annexation of Crimea, Transnistria again tried these efforts 
to persuade Russian Federation to recognize its independence, and Russia said, no, not now, not for you. So uh, they even separated this issue from Abkhazia and South Ossetia, who uh, have been recognized With immediately in 2008 after the Russian-Georgian War. So independence is not the option. Uh, the uh, United States uh, doesn't matter Federation, Confederation, any status. Uh, it's not so close because uh, now both sides are ready to speak only about technical issues, but not ready for so-called political negotiations. And when we say political negotiations, it means about the political status of Transnistria. So currently, we can expect that that uh, till the end of the year, Germany, as the chair of the OEC for 2016, uh, definitely will push two sides to reach at least some agreements. Uh, some protocols, some decisions about those four issues that I named uh, before. So to have at least some step forward. And it was uh, the statement of the German side after the negotiations in Berlin that we really hope that at least some practical sides will be done to change the um, to, to change the pattern that we see now. Because like two years, no negotiations, now we start. So we need to uh, seal them with some protocol or with some decision. Sure, Hannah. And before we one last question, I just sort of want to call the audience's attention to the plasma we have up. Uh, it's a four things you should know about Moldova's anti-oligarch uprising, um, and it gives some interesting background on the situation that we saw there this past winter with protests. But the question I have for you is uh, slightly different. I mean, people have seen Transnistria, Transnipur as sort of a model for Russia's operations in the Donbass as a, you know, not, not really a parallel so much as a foreshadowing. Uh, I'd be interested if you could talk a little bit about, you know, in what ways are they similar, but also in what ways are they different? Um, there is uh, definitely only one similarity that it is completely political, nothing ethnic in this uh, conflict. And uh, the second similarity, it is the um, manipulation of this Russian speaking or um, pro necessity to protect the uh, uh, pro-Russian elements uh, in uh, two regions. It was quite the same. Uh, probably yet one, it is the... Uh, um, so I, I can name it similarity that 25 years ago we also saw a lot of um, uh, fake news and a lot of uh, information warfare and gossip spreading that um, changed the situation. So in this it is definitely the same. What is completely different, uh, first of all, that Transnistria definitely doesn't have any borders with Russia. So it is much more difficult for them and for the Russian Federation to support Transnistria. There are limitations, just geographic limitations. The second issue is that luckily in um, Donbass in the very beginning we didn't have the Russian army. In Transnistria one of the issues that still uh, is very topical that uh, Russian Federation has the military base and uh, um, even when the peacekeepers were deployed at this territory, Russian Federation didn't want to withdraw them, saying that they are necessary to protect the storages of their ammunition, or uh, there were many, many reasons stated after this. The first was the protection of the ammunition. Sure. So uh, in our case, in, uh, if the border between Ukraine and Russia um, closed and uh, other uh, measures of the Minsk um, process uh, would be implemented, uh, there should be much easier for the uh, um, stopover effect. However, in Transnistria, uh, till the moment when you still have the Russian army and the Russian military at their territory, it always will be a possibility to trigger the conflict on the ground, but also for people to feel the fear. You right. know, that is the most important, that despite there is no fighting, despite there are no killings, wounded, explosions, any uh, symbols of the war. But the fear is still exists, right? Austria, the big fear, right. uh, because army is there, so it means that the danger and the threat exist. So we need protection. If we need protection, who can it be? Definitely Russians, because we think that Russians are friends. So there is something like a circle, you know, psychological circle in which these people are trapped for the last um, decades, and it is much more difficult to stop it uh, comparing to the new conflicts, because their people are still fresh in their memories about the uh, um, fear and uh, both sides. Okay, Hannah, well, thank you very much for taking time to talk with us, to Skype with us from Odessa. That was Hannah Shellas, editor-in-chief of uh, Ukrainska and the Analytica. Thank you, and we will be back in one second.
So perhaps the biggest corruption scandal to shake Ukraine over the past week was the so-called black accountancy leak of uh, 2012 Party of Regions bribe documents to uh, Ukrainska Pravda. The, uh, these documents, you can see a video of what the uh, documents themselves looked like there. They detailed bribe payments across Ukraine's then political spectrum. Right today, we have uh, Ihor Rozkladai of the Media Law Institute joining us to discuss the matter. How are you? I'm okay. <laughs> Thank you for coming. And so, party of region and uh, money. Uh, well, because some of those documents that we saw were, it was money going from the party of regions, but it was specifically going to people who were working in the Ukrainian media. press, yep. people in the media, including, um, these are allegations, I should say, Channel Inter and ICTV. Uh, and it's, it's only we could see from this document, because as we know, this is a very small part of uh, much bigger uh, amount of documents and maybe other channels also present there. But uh, uh, in fact, this wasn't, wasn't a surprise for us because we know that Ukrainian market is uh, very oligarch and really, uh, really concentrated. Yeah. In fact, we have five near five groups and uh, main... Uh, you mean five groups of each of one controlled by a specific yes, oligarchy? Yes, yeah. yep, so of course. Uh, the biggest one is intermedia group in uh, when the party of region became uh, or got into, into power, mm -hmm. this group uh, owns uh, nine TV channels, uh, different channels, uh, some of the movie, but also uh, channels uh, like news, political uh, channels, so on. And uh, for us, it was not a surprise that we see that uh, part of region pay for this channel. Why? Uh, first of all, uh, in 2005, uh, the owner of this channel uh, dead. It mm -hmm. was uh, Mr. Plushnikov, member of parliament. And uh, because of very un unclear uh, the ownership of this channel goes to Mr. Horoshkovsky and uh, our organization, uh, the Ostan Media Law Institute, we dig the own, uh, ownership of major TV channels. So and investigated, saw, essentially. Uh, yes, yeah. and we, uh, but we just only legal investigation. It's not uh, some hidden documents, only, <laughs> ju only just asking... Uh, Publicly available information. Yep, 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 yep. Yeah. And uh, we asked and we saw that the owner was Mr. Horoshkovsky and uh, one year later, ownership goes to Cyprus, mm -hmm. uh, to a company called UR Intermedia Group. And we know that uh, later uh, this UR Intermedia Group own a lot of other channels, NTN, uh, K1, K2, and the other one. Uh, that's why it was not surprised. Uh, also, for, for our audience, we need to explain what is media market and how it appeared. Sure. Uh, the first stage, it was uh, early 90s, uh, when uh, some uh, cable channels, primarily cable channels, with very piracy content, some movies like Disney movies, <laughs> or some films, or some clips, yeah. appeared. And uh, in uh, 1995, uh, first of all, uh, Interchannel appeared as uh, a clone of Russian ORT, or общественное российское телевидение. It's like quasi-PSB, but it's okay. really quasi-PSB. Like Russian public television. Yeah. Yep. And uh, this channel, as I remember, they uh, only uh, they had only own news, and the rest of the content was copy paste from uh, the ORT. You could, you could just pull, uh, switch to ORT and the, see the same content. Mm -hmm. Later, they became to be more independent, but still. Uh, uh, be, up to 2013, uh, ORT was the owner of 30% of holdership of this uh, channel. And it was obvious that they were changing the editorial stance, they were changing the content. They were trying match. to change, yeah. but uh, the content was uh, in some cases very similar to Russian because right. it's prepared uh, on the same field studios or in the same policy maybe. But how often is it the case though that it's an individual journalist taking a bribe? Uh, okay. Okay, as individual journalists and uh, how this money came to channel, mm -hmm. uh, uh, still it's very unclear because uh, as we understand, this is not official payment, for example, uh, like I, I'm going to channel and pay for advertisement or sure. something like that. Uh, we could only think how it could be. It could be maybe in some advertisement, but s through sales housing, or it could, could be black cash, of course. And uh, the purpose of this... Uh, uh, payments, uh, first of all, is advertisement. Or it's direct advertisement and uh, hidden advertisement, uh, also which called Jinsa. Mm -hmm. Jinsa is uh, Ukrainian uh, slang uh, term which um, uh, 
very old, uh, definitely, and uh, this term uh, means that uh, someone pay uh, in unfair way some sure. money for, for example, some commercial uh, advertisement which looks like analytical article or, or review article. And the same is for we, we talking about politics, about politics. So, I mean, you know, these documents which were released, I should note, by uh, Sergei Leshenka and uh, Ukrainska Pravda editor Sivgil Musayev about a week at a conference earlier this week. Um, you know, what effect do you think they're going to have on Ukraine's political landscape, first of all? And second, I mean, was, I mean you, you said that you weren't surprised. Uh, uh, you know, were you surprised I, I, by the individuals? I, I, I think that uh, di- now effect will be maybe zero. Zero. Is that uh, why? Is that because people... I mean, because, because it's, uh, unfortunately, it's a normal practice for all my media market. Right, because, I mean, most Ukrainians I talk to, they seem to think all journalists are just working in this way. I mean. Yes, uh, it's uh, in, in fact uh, uh, again uh, uh, nobody was surprised. It's just uh, documents which state that yes, it really happened. Okay. But uh, or in media market, at least uh, all know and knew that uh, a lot of media in the, uh, different ways take some black cash, especially during election times, because election times it's also uh, people know and media market knows that. Uh, Election time is a time when uh, some media earn money for next two, three years. Right. And, uh, I mean, in your opinion, does Ukraine really have freedom of speech? If it's not independent media, it's really just oligarchs oh. sort of battling, <laughs> battling each other. Is that you know, it's a very interesting question. Uh, yeah. In fact, uh, while uh, before party of region, in fact, we have uh, three or four different oligarchs who mm-hmm. fight between themselves. And we have quasi balance because we, ha- we could see different point of views from different oligarchs. <laughs> yes, it's not true freedom of speech, but it looks like. Okay. When the party of region came to power, uh, Yes, we have mostly monopoly of information. Only some small channels, some uh, independent journalists trying to be fair, trying to show that, yes, uh, independent journalists could be. But it was uh, very difficult that we could uh, recall, for example, a case of TVI channel when uh, all journalists who are even member of Gromadsky TV became as uh, they go out of the channel because yeah. of pressure, because of political pressure on uh, the editorial freedom. And, uh, and so I mean, now it's a very complicated question because, uh, yes, we have, again, we have right. different oligarchs who fight uh, between themselves and we have now grassroots in- initiatives who are trying to product more fair information than these all commercial companies. But uh, unfortunately, uh, the Auditory is quite smaller than... Sure. And, you know, another element of the, alleg- of the uh, release was that, in the Kiev Post, ran an article on these allegations, which is that the, uh, chair- the current chairman of the, election, of the Central Election Commission, Mikhailo Okhendovsky, took a uh, th- multi-thousand dollar bribe for a business trip. I spoke with Eric Heron. He's a professor of uh, political science at West Virginia State University. He studies Ukrainian elections about the effect of corruption on the country's electoral process. You can watch that video right now. I've done some research with a local Ukrainian NGO, Sifra Group, and what the publication of those records uh, sort of supports is what we have found in other work. That is, it is consistent with our findings in other research. So we've done work on technical parties and their effects on election outcomes. And let me, could you explain yeah. what do you mean by a technical party? Sure. So a technical party would be a formally registered party whose main purpose is not to win seats for itself, but rather to serve in a supportive role for another party, for its patron. So in the 2012 parliamentary elections, for example, there were many technical parties associated with the party of regions. And one of the benefits you get by having technical parties associated with you is you can get more seats on precinct or polling station election commissions. And by controlling those commissions, you can influence the results. I should say, though, the technical parties are not just a problem of the the party of regions. They haven't gone away with the sort of deterioration of the party of regions networks. It it is a phenomenon that cuts across the, the party system. So technical parties uh, and the control of election commissions can affect results, and we show this in our research. Uh, So what exactly was the research? I mean, how did you uh, 
co conduct it here? Sure. So, we in, with uh, the cooperation of the Central Electoral Commission, CIFRA Group um, and I collected different kinds of data. So we collected personnel records on members of polling station commissions. Mm -hmm. And in the early phase of registration for polling station commissions, as an election campaign starts, political parties or any participant in the electoral uh, contest who has the right to have commissioners produces a list of their commissioners. But the individuals might actually change their party affiliation, their location, their position before the election occurs. And by tracing those networks, you can see who is associated with whom, what technical parties are associated with what patrons. And then, with that information, you can look at the results. And you can say, if a party and its technical parties control the officers, what happens? Well, you, and this is not true for every party and not true for every election, uh, but you find they do a little better in the polling stations where they control the commission officials, the, the, the officers. And if it's neutrally managed, that shouldn't happen. Would it be enough to make an overall difference in the election? I mean, would it be enough to tip the balance? Or? In a close election, the answer is yes. Um, you know, we found, and again, it varied from election to election, and it varied from party to party, but a couple of percentage points on average. So you can imagine in a single member district race, you need less of a, an effect to potentially win an election. Um, in a close presidential race, it could matter. Now the interesting point about presidential elections, and some of our work on this is, a little, is still preliminary, but the 2010 election actually had almost no effect in the control of commissions. And the reason we suspect is that by the second round, there was partisan balance. The rules were different for the 2010 elections. And half of the commission was controlled by Yanukovych, half of the commission was controlled by Timoshenko, and the officers alternated. And I think this is an important message for Ukraine. It is not that reforms have to change the behavior or attitudes of people, that is, you know, there are individuals who will try to use the rules to their advantage. But if you can construct a system so they look, af look, look out um, over each other and try to challenge the other side, uh, you can neutralize the effect. So that was Eric Heron, the professor of political science at West Virginia University. You can find the full interview online. Another revelation that emerged from the leak was that the Party of Regions had paid around $45,000 to organize pro-Russian language meetings, the so-called language Maidan. Um, Russian language has, already, has always been sort of an issue in Ukraine that crosses both into the political and media spectrums. Uh, former government spin doctors used it to divide the country. I mean, to what extent is that sort of con continuing today in your view? To what extent does money play a role? Um, and I mean, you know, do you think we could see similar kind of manufactured protests along the same lines as the language Maidans? Could be. Could be, but uh, oh, again, uh, I'm not surprised about this because uh, we know that all uh, uh, things happened even uh, when Maidan started. Uh, we also see these guys who, who came from Donbass, from uh, the southern regions of Ukraine, and we uh, we had office on Staranovatnitska Street, and we saw this line of... I'm. I'm Maybe 40 buses, uh, people came to Kiev and yeah. to, to protest, and then they go to the free excursion because it's uh, <laughs> maybe for, for them, I understand them, that it was a, a real, maybe first possibility to see Kiev at uh, this, this time. But uh, we understand that it was for paid. Mm -hmm. It was not a normal process when people buy. It was their a own real money. expression of political will. Yeah, yeah. It, and it was very. Uh, big problem in those time, but uh, I could say that it's not uh, only party of region, but uh, previously it was also during uh, Orange com Command uh, time, sure. when we saw a lot of uh, paid protests, and uh, for a long time, uh, protests as it is was uh, 
the, this, this price because uh, people understand that if some process happened, it could be paid by someone and in some interest. And only Euromaidan, uh, maybe the first time when uh, people understand that, oops, something is, is something really... Uh, right. And going back to these documents, I mean, one interesting thing was that they gave them to NABU, the National Anti-Corruption Bureau. Mm -hmm. Do you think that any real investigation is going to come out of it well, or not? I, I, I believe, <laughs> I want to believe. Uh, because uh, really, uh, the, the one of the topics we want to, uh, to talk, to, yeah. to talk to public, it's major corruption in Ukraine. Because uh, these things are, it's, in fact, it's corruption. When someone paid for unfair, uh, the materials or unfair video, unfair news, and uh, sorry, is this corruption? Right. Someone paid in hidden way to uh, show people uh, not a fair uh, information with standards, uh, balancing standards, but someone prepared, and that's why uh, I believe that it could be a start for public discussion about that media corruption yeah. is the same corruption. So it's the opportunity for a start of a real public debate on this issue. Yep, yep, so we, uh, first of all, I want to thank you for taking the time to talk with us, Ihor. So thank you. Um, we spoke with Sivgil Musayeva Barovik at Mashihiri Fest, and uh, she's the editor of Ukrainska Pravda, the news organization that published these documents and broke the story, and you can watch it right here. For me, it was interesting because you can uh, show the size of uh, corruption and you can show uh, how it works in Ukraine because we know that there are some uh, sociological, uh, sociological companies. We know that here, uh, for example, Mikhail Hindovsky, and we know about bribes for different political parties. And of course, uh, these uh, 66 million of dollars, uh, which party of region spent just on uh, for um, bribes and for different, uh, it explains how that for in Ukraine uh, budget of political party can uh, be more than 100 million dollars per per one uh, year. You know, we have only 3% now of those documents because you, you know that uh, before Trepak said that uh, uh, he had more, he has more than uh, uh, he has documents uh, which show that um, the size of corruption more than two billion of dollars. We now hold just a small part of it. Uh, we publish only a small part of it. That's why it's very interesting who else can be in this list. Uh, and uh, we uh, know that uh, we have a reaction for different politicians for such information. For example, Leshko, uh, before publication, that sent uh, that it, uh, it's like a uh, campaign, political campaign against him and against his political party, uh, but we didn't show, uh, we didn't see his surname on those lists. So um, I think that uh, in this list, uh, possible to see different uh, people uh, from uh, uh, from uh, circle of pop, uh, Petro Prussian too. It's possible, and for example. Uh, for different politicians uh, who was in Maidan, during Maidan. Uh, we know that uh, Svoboda, for example, a political party also um, um, shared shared information that it's also a political campaign. One of the activists, not uh, Oleksiy Gnibok, uh, leader of this party, uh, but possible to, to see uh, such so names um, maybe in future. It's interesting for Ukrainian citizens because uh, uh, Ukrainian citizens understand that uh, such uh, practice of uh, financing of political party is still uh, working in uh, different ways. Uh, so, um, of course, uh, it's very difficult now to understand about uh, how it will work, for example, in future uh, about investigation. It, it will be good investigation or not be good investigation. It depends how our national Anti-corruption bureau will work in this case, um, um, 
but uh, I uh, hope that it will be discussion for such documents in, f in the future uh, in the Ukrainian p parliament too, because the main, not uh, like investiga investigation such things, it's also very important, but now uh, we, are we must work how to make uh, political uh, life in Ukraine more clear, how to make financing of political party more transparent. Uh, as for me, it's impossible to return such money back because we are still uh, talking about asset, uh, um, asset recovery after Yanukovych uh, regime and we are still in discussion how to return different assets uh, from Yanukovych uh, and from his uh, circle and his uh, uh, different groups. And it's a very hard work. Uh, asset recovery, it's very hard work. And uh, for such uh, things like black accounting, I think it's impossible actually. But I hope that Nabu will inform us about his investigation as, uh, as um, good as good as possible. More than four, for three days, uh, we have more than uh, uh, three. 300,000 uh, years in our website. And it's uh, very important. It's uh, uh, topic number one in all media in Ukraine. In, I got more than uh, 10 uh, um, uh, phone calls after different international media. It's interesting because it shows like how, how it works. Uh, for people understand that during long, long time that we have political corruption, but now they show they see how how it works and the size of this political corruption. And I saw and I think they uh, they are shocked about it. <laughs>